We've got two varieties of zucchini that we've planted in our vegetable garden this year that I'd like to show you. Right over here is a variety known as raven. And once you see the fruits, you'll get an idea of why it's called raven. They're very dark green, almost black. In fact, this one's still a little bit young. As it gets older, it'll get even darker. But uh, very dark fruited zucchini, sort of like the color of a raven. The dark colored zucchini have a lot of lutein in their skin. Lutein is an antioxidant that helps battle cancer causing free radicals in our bodies. And in one study it was found that the variety raven, because of this really dark skin, has four times the lutein as a regular uh, green zucchini. Raven is a heavy producer. You can see lots of flowers here. We've got lots of fruit coming on. And it is a zucchini that has a concentrated fruit set. That is, it will ripen a lot of its fruit at roughly the same time. So that way you can do your harvesting in a short amount of time. If you want to have more zucchini throughout the year with one of these concentrated fruit setting types, it would be a good idea to do successive plantings. Maybe every two weeks apart, come out and plant more zucchini seed in, in the garden. But uh, typical zucchini shaped fruit, cylindrical, shape, glossy green, and again, really dark, raven zucchini. Another thing I like about the plants is uh, just the way the leaves look. They're sort of a, sort of almost a variegated look, deeply lobed leaves in the garden. Very nice. Well, right over here, we have a very different type of zucchini, very different from raven. This is one known as kusa, and it is a Lebanese zucchini or Lebanese squash, sometimes as it's sometimes referred to. And its fruits, I have a very small one here. It is very popular here at our garden. A lot of the, the larger ones have been picked, but I've got a small one here to show you. And uh, as you can see, very different from Raven. It's very pale green. It has a white flesh, has a really nice nutty flavor. Now, Kusa is a variety that will ripen its fruit over a prolonged period so we can just keep harvesting them and usually that means until the, uh, the squash bugs or the uh, squash vine borers do in the plants. But uh, Kusa, Lebanese zucchini, a lot different than the uh, very dark raven zucchini. The flowers of the zucchini plant are of two types. We have male flowers and female flowers on the very same plant. And the pollen that is produced in the male flowers is very heavy, it's sticky, and it's not pollinated, or it's not moved to the female flower by the wind. It has to be transferred via honeybee or bumblebee. So we have to have pollinators in the garden for our zucchinis to become pollinated and set really good fruit. If we don't have enough pollinators, we can get poor pollination and our zucchini won't develop. If you've ever had zucchini that only gets to be about two to three inches long, then it shrivels up and just falls from the plant, that's due to lack of pollination. Well, there are a number of ways we can increase pollinators presence in our garden. We can reduce the use of pesticides, especially whenever bees are present. We can also plant some flowers like zinnias or, or some of the other daisy, daisies, some of those flowers that will actually produce nectar and attract the pollinators to the garden. Or we can play the part of the honeybee or the pollinator and do some hand pollinating, and I'll show you how to do that. First thing we have to do is identify the male and female flowers. And the female flowers are pretty easy to recognize. You can see this one right here. It's got the zucchini here at the base, sort of a little undeveloped zucchini. It's just now starting to grow. Right down here is a, another one that's a little bit smaller, a little bit, uh, little bit younger. But you can see that undeveloped zucchini at the base of the flower. Now right up here is a male flower. You can see there's no, no little zucchini on its stalk there. It's, got a longer stalk as well. But this is the male flower and uh, we can use it to transfer pollen. Now it's important to note that the flowers are only good for a day, so it's a good idea to come out early in the morning if you want to do some hand pollinating. Now we could take a little, a little paintbrush 
or uh, something like a Q-tip and just reach down in there and get some of that pollen. This one's got a little bit of water down inside there, so I'm just gonna kinda dump that out before that pollen gets, gets too wet. But I'm just peeling off these petals to uh, make those pollen producing, producing stamens a little bit more accessible. But you can see some pollen there on the end. I'll get a little bit on my, my finger there, a little bit of that yellowish orange pollen from the male flowers. And then we just come down to a freshly opened female flower. And again, it's okay to kind of tear some of those, those petals out of the way there. And expose the pistils or the female part of the flower, the female flowers here. And what we can do, we can just take our male flower, and just dab that pollen onto the end of the female flowers. And again, this will be doing the part of the pollinators or the honeybees or bumblebees and we can do a few different flowers with each male flower but uh, hopefully now we've got plenty of pollen transferred and the zucchini will develop into a nice fruit well while we're talking about zucchini flowers i just want to point out something that's somewhat interesting maybe you didn't know there's another way you can enjoy your zucchini flowers and that is, you can eat them. They are edible. I've got a large male flower here. I'm just gonna reach in and remove that, that, uh, that stamen there with all that pollen. If I wanted, I could go around and pollinate a few more flowers. But uh, with the, uh, the petals of the zucchini blossom, we can take some ground beef or some rice or maybe some shrimp and just stuff it down in there. And then we can lightly fry this or, or grill it or steam these flowers. Just another way to enjoy the flowers of your zucchini. Like zucchini, corn also has two types of flowers. It has male flowers and female flowers. The male flowers of the corn are up here at the top. The tassels are the male flowers. You might be able to see some of those anthers sort of dangling there, dropping the pollen. Here on this leaf you can you can see a lot of that pollen that's fallen, see that little yellow dust there. Lots of pollen here from our male corn flowers. The female flowers of the corn plant are down here. They're on the ear, and it is the silks. The silks of the corn ear are the female flowers. And the pollination doesn't need to be done by insects or pollinators. It simply just falls or is blown by the wind from the tassels to the silks. Each one of these silks is attached to a kernel down inside the, uh, the husk on the cob here or in the ear. And it takes one pollen grain for each of these silks. The pollen grains will fall, they'll attach to the silks, the pollen grains then do a sort of germination and grow down into the ear and pollinate or fertilize the kernels and that is what develops the corn. We will know that we don't have good pollination of our corn if whenever we open up a husk and there's more cob than corn, if there's some spaces where there aren't any kernels on the cob, we'll know that no pollen grain made it to those silks to fertilize those kernels. Now, we could have poor pollination of our corn if it were to be planted in a long row as opposed to a block like we've got here in our studio garden. Corn planted in a long row in the garden can suffer from poor pollination just because if we have a wind that comes in from the side, it can blow all that pollen over into the neighbor's garden or somewhere down the road and it'll miss the silks of the developing ears. So plant your corn in a block as opposed to a long row. That way, no matter which way the wind blows in, some of the ears will be pollinated. We've got a block of sweet corn here in our garden. Sweet corn is different from field corn in that it's a lot sweeter, it's a lot tastier. It has the ability to produce and store sugars in its kernels. And once the peak ripeness occurs, those sugars are quickly converted into starch. So that's why fresh sweet corn always tastes better if it comes from your garden rather than coming from the grocery store. 
Now, the ability to store those sugars in the kernels is a genetic trait of sweet corn. Another genetic trait is the propensity to sucker. And you can see we've got some suckers coming off the stalks of our sweet corn. Now, some sources will tell you to remove those suckers, but I'm telling you, you don't have to waste your time. Just, just leave the suckers on the corn plant as long as you've got plenty of room in between the rows, at least 30 inches between the rows, you'll have plenty of room to let those suckers develop and you don't have to remove those from your corn. They'll actually photosynthesize and help those ears develop. And as a bonus, we sometimes get small ears of corn even on the suckers. So just go ahead and leave those suckers on your sweet corn. Don't worry about taking those off. Another thing that will help those developing ears become nice good ears of corn is to make sure that we water our corn very well during dry periods, especially as those ears are developing. We can apply a mulch to our corn. We've got some grass clippings, some pine needles in here to kind of hold in some moisture. And another thing the mulch does is it helps keep some of the weeds out of the garden. There are a lot of gardeners who like to take a hoe and go through and hoe the rows of corn to get those weeds out of there. That's perfectly all right. Just don't go too deep to where we start severing the roots of our corn plants. We don't want to go more than an inch deep. Otherwise, our corn may start to fall over in the high winds. We can still plant corn here in Oklahoma. We can still sow corn seed up through the first week of July. Just remember that under high temperatures, we're gonna have to make sure it's well watered and the corn will also ripen much faster. Now, anyone growing corn will have to deal with the corn earworm, those caterpillars that burrow into the ears and feed on the kernels. They come from a moth that lays its eggs on the silks. Those eggs will hatch and then they tunnel into the ears and start feeding on those kernels. So any sprays that you want to try to use to control those should be directed at the silks. Try to get those, those young hatching corn earworm caterpillars. If you do not want to use any chemicals in the garden, you could come out with some mineral oil and coat the silks with the mineral oil to try to disrupt the, uh, the caterpillar laying and, and hatching process. If you do use the mineral oil technique, be aware that it can affect the pollinating process. The oil on the silks can affect the developing kernels with the pollen from those tassels. There are some gardeners I know that will actually mix a little bit of vegetable oil in with their insecticides and target those silks. If you do use any insecticides on your corn, make sure that they are labeled for corn. Well, you could do what I do when it comes to combating the corn earworm, and that is to just harvest the ears, cut away the affected part, the part that has been eaten by the worm. They get theirs, I get mine, and everybody's happy. I hope you have success growing corn in your garden this year. Mm -hmm.